This is Arbroglund on Scotland's southern coast, the birthplace of the father of the US Navy. And this is Whitehaven in Cumbria, scene of a daring raid that didn't really go according to plan, but struck a psychological blow to the British Empire. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the story of John Paul Jones. This is the place the man himself was born. This is an 18th century Scottish cottage. Got an ingle nook, kind of a fireplace, massive fireplace there. Some rudimentary furniture. This is the kind of thing people would have sat on, which is pretty grim. I think I'd, I think I'd rather just pull up a rug on the floor or something, but there's no rugs in here. So yeah, a little bit devoid of luxuries. He was born in 1747 the son of the head gardener, and he lived in this house, which, not surprisingly, is now the John Paul Jones Museum. Although, he wasn't actually born John Paul Jones. Originally, he was just John Paul. Box bed. This is exactly the kind of furniture they would have had at the time. When he was 13, John Paul went to sea. He sailed out of Whitehaven, just over there on the Cumbrian coast. He served in the British Merchant Navy. At least a few of his voyages were aboard slave ships. Eventually he grew disgusted with the trade and had to hitch a ride on a ship home from Jamaica. When he was 21, he was sailing aboard the brig, John, when the captain and the first mate both died of yellow fever. As the only person on board who could navigate, he took over charge of the ship and brought it home. The owners promptly made him captain and gave him a 10% share of all the cargo. On his second voyage though, he had one of his sailors flogged because of an attempted mutiny. The man died a few weeks later, leaving John Paul on the hook for murder. He was locked up in the nearby Kirkubri tollbooth, but later released on bail. Then, during another alleged attempted mutiny, he ran a sailor through with a blade. He decided at that point it was probably a good time to make an exit and fled to the colony of Virginia. His brother had been living in Virginia and had been adopted by a family known as Jones. It's at that point that John Paul cunningly disguised his own name by tagging Jones onto the end of it. In 1775, he volunteered for the brand new Continental Navy, where he became the first first lieutenant appointed. He took command of a 30-gun ship. USS Alfred and a crew of 300. On his first voyage, he was the first person to raise the Grand Union flag on an American ship. This was the beginning of the US War of Independence, and John Paul's job was to cause as much disruption and mayhem as possible for British freight ships, which he did pretty well. Then, in 1777, he took control of the USS Ranger. But he wasn't happy about it. He'd been promised a frigate, but he fell out with Commodore Essex Hopkins. Jones thought the Commodore was talking down his achievements, and he wound up with a smaller ship. He sailed to France aboard the Ranger. While he was there, he did some serious hobnobbing and made friends with one Benjamin Franklin. The French were about to join the war on the US side, so John Paul began operating out of the port of Brest. That's when he decided on a spot of light invasion. He sailed for home in Whitehaven behind me, but the winds were against him. So instead, he crossed the Irish Sea and made for Carrick Fergus. He'd heard HMS Drake was moored just off the port, and there were prisoners aboard. As they pulled alongside the Drake around midnight, one of the sailors dropped anchor but mistimed it. Jones had to cut the rope and get out of there. Luckily, the wind had changed, so back he came to Whitehaven. The plan was simple. On the 23rd of April, just after midnight again, he launched two boats with 15 men each. Whitehaven had an inner and an outer harbour. John Paul landed one boat in the outer harbour with the intention to disable the town guns by spiking them, driving a nail into the place the powder went. The other boat landed in the inner harbour. They were supposed to set fire to as much of the harbour as they possibly could and possibly any of the town they could too, in order to instill maximum terror. They managed to disable the guns. This is Long Tom, one of the actual guns they spiked. Kinda cool. But they'd run out of lantern fuel. 
They weren't setting fire to anything. Thinking on their feet, some of them made for a local pub. Surely they could get a light from someone there. The thing is though, a lot of the sailors were kind of in it for the booty and there wasn't an awful lot here. Their heart wasn't really in the whole raiding thing, so they stopped for a bit of a drink. Eventually, Joe and Paul managed to round them all up and get out of there. They only managed to set one of the boats in the harbour ablaze, but that was full of coal, so I suppose they thought the other ones might catch. No such luck. Not content at that, he sailed to St Mary's Isle near the fun to pronounce Kirkubri, on the other side of the Solway Firth. There, he planned to kidnap the Earl of Selkirk, partly to ransom him for prisoners and partly to settle an old score. He was one of the ones who'd wanted to put John Paul away for murder. When he got there, the Earl was away. His crew weren't overly happy with the whole personal vendetta thing though, and they wanted something for their trouble. They wanted to take the silver. Jones was disgusted, so much so, he actually made sure it got sent back after the war. None of his raiding around that time had netted him much in terms of spoils or really any real damage, but in PR terms, it was massive. The new Continental Navy had struck a hammer blow in the shores of the UK, at the heart of the British Empire. It was a wake-up call. By September 1779, Lieutenant Jones had his hands on the 42-gun Bonhomme Richard. Apologies for the French pronunciation there. I noticed there was a sign on the, on the door that said, please enter into John Paul Jones' captain's cabin. I actually thought it was going to be a sign that said, don't come in here, but uh, just goes to show you, A, I need reading glasses, and B, you should always read the sign on the door. So this is actually a replica of his cabin on his ship, the Bonhomme Richard. They were sailing with four other American ships in the North Sea, near Flamborough Head in Yorkshire. They clapped eyes on some British merchant ships, along with two Royal Navy ships. In the ensuing battle, Jones's ship was seriously damaged, partly because one of the other officers in his own fleet kept blasting his ship. The masts and the flags had been blown away. He was sinking. A British captain asked if he would surrender. Jones is reputed to have said, I have not begun to fight. Although the version reported in the newspapers at the time was, I may sink, but I'll be damned if I strike. He's even said to have shot some of his own officers who were trying to surrender. You can kind of see where all the mutiny came from. He rammed HMS Serapis, boarded his crew and captured her. The French made him Chevalier John Paul Jones and Congress made a gold medal in his honour. Over here he was viewed a bit differently though. Despite campaigning after the war, there was no place for him in the US Navy which had been disbanded. Eventually he went to Russia to serve in the Black Sea fleet of the Empress Catherine the Great, but he didn't get on too well with the Russian officers. He was made US Consul to Algiers, but he was never able to take up his post. He died in 1792, aged 45. The French preserved him in booze and buried him in a lead coffin, assuming he'd be picked up later on, but his grave was forgotten about and it took a US ambassador, General Horace Porter, six years to find him. In 1905, he was moved to the US Naval Academy in Annapolis and placed in a marble and bronze tomb under permanent guard. The Port of Whitehaven gave him an honorary pardon in 1999 and awarded the US Navy the freedom of the port. And the US consulate is this wine merchant. It's kind of mad to think all oh, that started right here. And if things had been slightly different, he could have been a gardener. See you next time.